Welcome to High Truths on Drugs and Addiction, where national experts bring you facts and answer your questions. I am your host, Dr. Onit Lev, an emergency and addiction doctor who has served at the White House and still practices on the front lines. Right here on High Truths, you will learn from experts, hear stories from the emergency department, and listen to people who have struggled from addiction. Friends, fentanyl is plaguing America. It has infected all illicit drugs, from cocaine to meth, counterfeit pills, and even marijuana. If you're around someone who may be using drugs, you should carry naloxone, the opioid reversal agent. Carrying naloxone for drugs is like carrying an EpiPen for allergies. If you need a prescription for naloxone, you should have one, no questions asked. That is why I'm offering a free prescription to anyone who needs one. Come visit me on hightruths.com to learn more about the show, submit a question, or download a free prescription for naloxone. And if you like the show, do me a favor, give us a five-star review and subscribe. Your stars are very much appreciated and go a long way in supporting the program. Today's episode is sponsored by Families Against Fentanyl. FAF is an organization set on breaking the status quo of failed solutions and to get to the core of the supply chain of deadly fentanyl. Learn more about FAF by visiting familiesagainstfentanyl.org and sign their petition to declare illegal fentanyl a weapon of mass destruction. Hello again, High Truth listeners. Today, we have a legislative discussion on drugs and addiction. I'm your host, Dr. Roni Lev. I learned how a bill becomes a law from Schoolhouse Rock. I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill. And I'm sitting here on Capitol Hill. When I started, I wasn't even a bill. I was just an idea. Some folks back home decided they wanted a law passed, so they called their local congressman and she said, you're right, there ought to be a law. I'm Just a Bill is such a catchy educational song. He signed you, Bill. Now you're a law. Today, we will follow the non-cartoon version of how a bill becomes a law, one that I'm very, very proud of. Let me start by sharing my backstory for SB 864, Tyler's Law on Fentanyl Testing. When I left the White House and returned to the front lines of the pandemic in the emergency department, I wanted to continue the work and some of the projects I left at ONDCP, the Office of National Drug Control Policy. I created this High Truth podcast and focused my efforts locally. I established the San Diego Credo Task Force, the Community Response to Drug Overdose Task Force that mirrored a White House project I worked on. We united the three Ps, public health, public safety, and prevention. Through this task force, we identified a major gap. Hospitals were not testing for fentanyl, the leading cause of overdose deaths. Our Credo Task Force realized that this was an important gap to close, and we heard some compelling cases. The medical examiner could not give a definitive answer to parents whose 14-year-old boy died from presumed fentanyl. His drug screen in the emergency department was normal, and then he was in the ICU in a coma on a fentanyl drip. This confused the toxicology reports for the medical examiner. In another case, a law enforcement officer thought he was exposed to fentanyl on the job and could not be convinced that he really was not exposed because the hospital drug screen did not include that test. I was one of few physicians who had access to rapid fentanyl testings available within an hour, and I found it very impactful when I shared test results with my emergency patients. I entered a quest to become a fentanyl testing expert. I tracked down the manufacturers of the fentanyl testing reagents and even contacted the FDA to learn what is and was not available. I did become that expert, and I used that information to create a toolkit so every hospital in America can easily get the same rapid fentanyl test results as I do. In a local campaign with 24 hospitals in San Diego County, within 10 months of this campaign and sharing this toolkit, the majority of hospitals included fentanyl in their drug screens. I thought it was a great project, really brilliant, and realized that all California hospitals needed to do the same. Since hospitals were not all coming around to testing on a voluntary basis, they needed a legislative nudge to do the right thing. 
and I found the perfect partners with Senator Melissa Melendez and Julie Seamus. Senator Melendez represents California's 28th District. She's a veteran of the United States Navy, where she became fluent in Russian and one of the first women to fly aboard a reconnaissance aircraft overseas. Julie Seamus is mother of Tyler, who died of fentanyl days after testing negative for fentanyl at a California emergency department. Senator Melissa Melendez and Julie Seamus, welcome to High Truths. Good morning. Thanks for having us. So I wanted to start by giving a little background to our audience about yourselves. Um, let's start with you, uh, Senator Melendez. Uh, tell us about your background. How do you become a senator? How <laughs> fun is it or how painful is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, boy, that's a long conversation. <laughs> um, so, you know, I was born and raised in Ohio. I'm a Midwestern gal. Um, came to California many, many years ago, uh, met my husband, who is from California, and we decided to move out here once we started having children, since all the family is out here. Um, and, you know, I served my time in the Navy. I'm not sure if you're aware of that. That's actually how I met my husband, Liz. We were both serving in the Navy. And, you know, as far as how was I how I got into this Senate thing, um, I blame my husband and my father-in-law for that <laughs> because they were the ones who encouraged me originally to run for local city council. Um, and I did that. And then I was approached to run for state assembly. Um, and then an opportunity came open to run for state Senate because a state Senator at the time had resigned. And so it left an open seat. So this Long story short, this was not planned. This is not something I ever envisioned myself doing, yet here I am, and I'm grateful and thankful that I've had the opportunity to, you know, work with people like Julie and with you, Dr. Lev, to to put forward some laws that are really meaningful and that will have an impact on a lot of people's lives. Thank you. And Julie, how about you? My background is I was an elementary school teacher in the inner city for five years, and then I stopped when I had my oldest daughter, who's now 25. And then I was um, my PTA mom, uh, stay-at-home mom. I was always involved in all of their things. And then when my son passed away, I became an advocate to try to prevent this from happening to any other family. And so that's now what I do full-time. We have a, a, my family has a foundation called Drug Awareness Foundation. And I spend my time trying to advocate, trying talking to schools, talking to parents, Trying getting laws passed and school districts to have Narcan, um, things like that. Wow, and you've been really effective. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, our bill together, SB 864, Tyler's bill. Uh, a special shout out to Senator Brian Jones because I came to him two years ago with this idea of fentanyl testing. And he was very gracious in getting me language. So I had unbacked language for um, this bill, but with the, no one to carry it. The, at that time, it was COVID. Everybody was busy. There was a limit on the number of legislation people can have. And so I just had this language, and I was searching for someone to take it. And then I met you, Julie. And tell us, uh, tell us about that, how you first heard about this proposal and how did you find Senator Melendez? Okay, well, I was on a Zoom about marijuana uh, legislation and I met a woman named Heidi Anderson and I was telling her my background and telling her that after my son died, they, you know, they had to test him for fentanyl and I was trying to contact all the emergency rooms around here and I had no luck. And she told me about you, Dr. Lev. She says, there's this great doctor down in San Diego. I'm going to give you her email. And why don't you contact her? Because she's trying to do the same thing. So I believe I emailed you and got the, the legislation. And I said, you know, I'm happy to shop it around. Because if there's one thing I'm good at is nagging and, and nudging people, <laughs> according to my kids. Uh, so I... I knew Senator Melendez because I had actually written a letter in support of Alexandra's law. And I was so touched that Senator Melendez wrote me a handwritten thank you note, because if anyone knows anything about politics, it's impossible enough to get in touch with a politician, much less get a reply, a handwritten reply. So I sent it to Senator Melendez. I sent it to a bunch of other senators. 
and Hannah, who was your, the chief of staff so, or legislative uh, director. Ledge director, yeah. She's amazing. <laughs> so she got back in touch with us and she was on it. You know, she had us meeting with different groups, um, different lobbyists, and she really was amazing, I think, in recognizing exactly what had to be done and, and eliminating any hurdles we might have. Yes, she was amazing. She got those meetings like, no, she didn't waste any time. She had it boom, 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 had everybody lined up. And so, Senator, tell us about, on your perspective, you you heard from uh, Julie, she, you were, you had it, Hannah, do some work uh, on background. How do you decide what you're going to take on? Is it, you know, does it meet your criteria? How did you, how, what was the selection process and what made you feel like this was a, a, a good bill that you want to take on? Well, for this particular bill, you know, I had already done some work on the fentanyl issue with Alexandra's law, which we were not successful in getting passed. And that was through my meetings with, um, you know, Matt Capilouto and his family and the death of his daughter, Alexandra. So it had some experience. And so when Julie approached me about this bill, you know, the you, you take your losses for sure. And it was disappointing to not get Alexandra's law passed, but you don't give up. And you, you try to nibble away at the problem every chance you get. And this was an opportunity to make some progress. It's not all of the progress we want to make, but it is a start. And, you know, my heart breaks for these families that have gone through this. It, I, I cannot imagine. I'm a mom of five. And honestly, I just, it sounds cliche, but my heart breaks for the families who, who have having to go through this. And so I wanted to do, you know, what I could. Um, to help. And this bill was really didn't have any opposition um, from legislators. I mean, we did a good job of making sure we rounded up the support, make sure they understood what the issue was and how helpful it can be and how successful it has been in San Diego, thanks to you. And that oftentimes is very helpful. You know, when you can show a success model from the very beginning, that's helpful in getting people uh, to get on board. So, you know, it was kind of one of those situations where I, I certainly just could not say no, not from a moral ground, certainly, and not from, you know, just the perspective of, of a fellow mom. Wow. Thank you for that, because uh, we've we've made history here um, with the first uh, state um, in the United States to, to have fentanyl uh, testing as a, a mandatory whenever a drug screen is ordered. But in your, how many bills are you allowed to carry? Is it, you know, do you have a certain workload? Like I can only do so many, uh, I have only certain subjects or what would be your advice to other people who have ideas for bills and they're approaching um, Congress people to carry their idea? So for the state legislature, I'm not sure what the rules are for Congress, but for our purposes, for the state legislature, um, our legislative session is, is, is two years long. So we are allowed to introduce 40 bills um, that, that have to last through that two years. Now, uh, you know, a lot of times people will introduce all 40 of those bills if they're doing that many. Um, in the very first year, and sometimes it takes you two years to get them through. Of course, not all of them make it through. Um, so you know, personally, I think that's still too many. Um, I, you know, I would like to see that number lessened, but um, that's, that's not going to happen anytime soon. So 40 is the magic number. And this bill just, you know, you have to make sure that you have the support. And, and I think we did a very good job of that. And, um, you know, you, the two of you were instrumental in, in getting this through. I mean, it's, you know, no legislator does this alone. Um, and we get a lot of ideas from from different people. You know, we get ideas um, from special interest groups and we get ideas from our constituents. And that's really where I like to get most of my bills is from constituents or at least, you know, real people on the ground living in their districts. Because to me, that says that that's something that's needed by the community and therefore will be helpful to you know, a lot of people, not just one particular special interest group. It's not that we don't, you know, do bills that are presented to us by some other groups, but the bulk of them, for me anyway, are you know they originate from from constituents. 
Interesting. Is that special about you? Because we know, and I've kind of watched as uh, being involved in medical politics, um, that, that there's a lot of money, a lot of lobbyists, and they're the ones yeah. who who get the work done. Actually, even more than the, the you know the, the senators and assembly men. And is it unusual for someone like me and Julie to just to have an idea and kind of really on our own make it happen? Uh, I will tell you it's not unusual, but it doesn't happen as often as you would think it would or I think that it should. I mean, there are a lot of bills that go through the legislature and many of which were not, you know, that particular legislator's idea. Somebody came to them and presented it, whether it was the California Medical Association or a particular union or, you know, whatever the case may be, it is very often not that uh, legislator's original idea. Sometimes it is. I'm just saying the bulk of their bills are not something they sat down and thought about. A lot of times you're right. The special interest groups that come forward and say, hey, would you run this bill for us? They do really the bulk of the work and getting it written and getting all the kinks worked out. Um, But when it comes to a bill that's originated by constituents, that's different because then, you know, you're on your own, your constituent, the legislator, anyone else that's willing to help like you, Dr. Lev, wait, you know, then it's just us. And and it's our job to make sure we gather the support. It's our job to make sure we anticipate who the opposition is going to be, what their opposition is, try to allay any, you know, concerns that they have. You have to work with them throughout the process and then hope that no one shows up, you know, mid process out of the blue and says, well, we oppose this bill and here's why, especially if it's an influential group um, or person, then, you know, you run into problems, which we had a a little bit of that with this particular bill. And we did have the hospital association come forward with late opposition, but luckily, you know, we were able to work through that, but that does happen. Yeah. So walk us through the the process of what happens after you've accepted this idea that Julie brought to you. Um, you said, okay, I'm going to take this on. N- now what happens? Takes us to your Senate hearing. What happens? Okay. So you introduce the bill in the Senate. It gets sent to the Rules Committee. The Rules Committee then decides which other committees it must go and be heard in. So sometimes that's just one committee. Sometimes they refer it to more than one committee, which is you know even more difficult. So you get your bill assigned to committee, the health committee, for instance, in this case, and then you work to make sure it gets through that committee. Then it has to go, if it's just assigned to one committee, it then has to go to the appropriations committee. If there's any cost, you know, well, a certain cost associated with it, you have to make sure it gets through there because a lot of very good bills die in the appropriations committee. If you're lucky enough to get it out of there, it goes to the Senate floor for a full vote. You have to get it off the Senate floor and then it goes over to the assembly and it goes through that exact same process all over again. Um, And then you have to get the bill to the governor and then get him to sign it. So it's it is a long process um, and there's a lot of work, you know, along the way that has to be done and little problems that, that crop up. But all along the way, you know, you're you're hearing from perhaps the opposition. And so you're working on that and you're building support as you go along. And it's really um. It's a special kind of process when it's a constituent based bill because you are working directly with the person who is emotionally invested in this law getting passed. And that makes it different. And and I will tell you from personal experience, that makes you work that much harder to make sure it gets through because there is a face associated, a person feelings associated with the passage of that bill. And that makes it very different. Yeah, and well, thank you so much for that that effort. And again, the extra support because everybody else has all their senator, their lobbyists and lawyers and everyone else. And and when you're working alone, you don't you don't have that. So, uh, Julie, you 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 got this through. Uh, the senator took on the cause, and now you had to build your own support and coalition to write letters and establish your own kind of lobby since you don't have a paid lobbyist working on your behalf. Tell us about building a coalition. So I have to give a shout out to Matt Capaluto because he helped me a lot. He really paved the way with Alexandra's Law. We are in a lot of groups on Facebook for grieving parents. And so he showed me kind of what to write and how to get people to call in and write into the portal. And I just 
put it out there to every single person I knew and asked them if they could write letters and call in during the hearing. And they did. And then I sent between any time that there was going to be a vote like appropriations, you don't call in, but I sent letters to all the senators. And then before I went for a vote to the whole Senate, I sent letters to emails to every single senator. And um, that's kind of just a lot of emailing. <laughs> yeah, and then and your and your Facebook page and and other things that you that you kind of did. And if I could interject, Doctor Love, just for a moment, I, um, what you know, Julie's being very humble about this whole process, but you can imagine, of course, you know how hard it is for someone to kind of relive that experience in each committee hearing and having to give your testimony. It's painful. And you really don't want to, re it's like going through a trial over and over again and having to share, you know, what happened to you. Nobody wants to do that. It doesn't feel good. And it, you feel like, you know, I'm just, I'm breaking open an old wound. But Julie and her family did that because it matters, because they wanted to do something to make sure that there aren't other families that this happened to. And I just have to say, you know, I, I don't know if I personally could have done that. It, I mean, it's emotionally draining and, and I'm just so, so proud of her and her family for being willing to do that because I know it was hard. Um, I mean, it, you know, it makes me cry practically every time we start talking about, it. I can't imagine what Julie's going through. So I just wanted, you know, for those who are, who are watching this podcast to understand just the difficulty that comes along with doing something like this, especially when you have no idea whether someone is going to accept your idea or not. I mean, with Alexandra's Law, we worked really hard and we had so many people call in in support of the bill and ultimately they killed the bill. I mean, that's devastating. So you are invested in this idea, but you have no idea what the outcome is going to be. And that takes you know, very special kind of grit to be willing to do that, um, not knowing what's going to happen. Very true. Thank you so much for doing that because it is, it takes bravery um, to to do that. And again, Julie, that the reason that I'm sure like you heard it from the Senator and from me too, um, you're the reason we do what we, what we do. So really thank you. And we couldn't do that. Um, thank you. Thank you both. <laughs> And uh, so, Senator, the most important supporters of this bill um, in, in getting a coalition, who would you say was instrumental in? Well, I, the two of you. <laughs> I mean, honestly, um, it's, you know, it, it you have to have, everybody has to be all in. Those who are, you know, bringing the idea for it, they've got to be all in. They've got to be, be willing to work very hard alongside you know, with me to get this bill over each hurdle that comes up. And the two of you did that beautifully and bravely. So those are the most important people in this bill. Now, along the way, of course, Hannah was very, very helpful in making sure everything was lined up, make sure everybody's, you know, concerns were addressed, making sure I was aware of everything that was going on. Um, but it's the parents really who who called in in support and wrote letters of support that that coalition was the most important one for getting this bill passed because you know like i said there these are real people real emotions real families that have been affected by this issue um, who were calling in and support of this bill and that's it's not some abstract idea but you know about the environment or about cars or you know some other type of idea this is this has an emotional attachment to it, and and it makes a huge difference when everybody who's felt the same pain has been willing to come forward and kind of put that pain out there for all to see in the hopes of of getting the bill passed. And I did notice that the all the all the senators, Julie, when when you talk, they they really showed the the respect um, that that a, a parent who loses a child d deserves to have. They did, and, and a few of them came up to me after, and even um, one of the sheriffs that was working in the courtroom came up to me after. So I felt really heard. Yeah. So I just I do want to say one shout out to um, Tim Madden, who's the lobbyist for the chapter of the American College of Emergency Physicians, the California chapter, because I am a, a past president, and I was able to 
reach out to him and uh, just navigate because this is a new field. You know, I'm you know I'm an emergency physician, and there are you know policies and procedures of what to say, how to negotiate, um, and, and he kind of helped me through through that process, and I just I appreciate that as well. And the California Emergency Room nurses were very supportive. Huge, right? They took on this as their main cause, and and they use this on their lobby day. And Julie, you spoke to them as well. I did. Yeah, and Julie, this was your first time. This is not again your profession either. You went to the Senate and testified for the very first time. What was that like? Um, you know, I was ner- I was very nervous just because I'm the kind of person I like to plan, and I did not know what to expect at all. Um, but it was good. I mean, everyone listened. Um, the second time was maybe better because you were there in person and you were not at the first one. You just testified by phone. Mm-hmm. But it was good. You know, I was nervous every time because you don't know how they're going to respond. You don't know if it's going to become like a partisan issue or you just never know what's going to happen. Yeah, you, we were given three minutes between the two of us and, and they were very strict, right? It's the hard part is the limit in testimony, which is so frustrating. I mean, honestly, we've had this conversation over the years about changing this process so that bills are vetted more properly so that there are more questions asked and you, you know, you don't ask more questions unless you're provided more testimony on which to ponder. And that's not happening. It's a very hurried process right now. You know, you get your three minutes, hurry up, move on to the next one. It's like an assembly line. That is no way to properly vet good policy or bad policy. So I know, you know, Julie and I spoke before her testimony and I tried to give her kind of the rundown of, okay, here's how this is going to go down. This is what you can expect. So she wasn't shocked because it's already hard enough to go there and give this testimony. I didn't want anything to throw her off her game, which is very easy to do when you're talking about something that's so close to your heart. And boy, she did just such a great job. I wish they had given her more time, but she did a remarkable job. And so did you, Dr. Lev. Yes, and Julie, definitely. You're a superstar, really honed in. And re- you were speaking on Tyler's behalf, but I felt like you were speaking on behalf of all the parents, you know, thousands of parents who, who've had the same issue as you. Um, so you did have a lot on your shoulders. Yeah, I've been hearing from a lot of parents. I went to a retreat yesterday, Glenn Ivy, with a bunch of moms who had lost their kids, and two of them you know, thanked me and said, that's what happened to their kids. And, you know, I just, I didn't know how widespread it was, how much of an issue, but after it's now been put out there and the news has done stories and stuff, I've been hearing from more people about it. So Senator, I felt like this is all, you know, the, the, that the three minutes was kind of like a show, but everything was already decided before we testified in the backroom deals. Right. So, you know, I think the day before uh, I had a meeting and and I think uh, Tim Madden helped out and Senator Pam wanted to change the language, but the language didn't even make sense to what he wanted. I mean, drug testing doesn't even happen that way. The, the, The rules that he wanted, it showed a complete misunderstanding of what happens in the hospital. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, well, D- Dr. Pan is a pediatrician. He doesn't work in the ER like you do. So you're right. It is a different environment. Um, it, you know, as far as backroom deals, uh, that does happen, you know, on, on a number of bills, not every bill, certainly, but there are times when there's some things going on in the background to get a bill out of, but what we do before a bill ever gets to committees, we make sure that we contact every member of that committee and ask them, are you okay with this bill? If not, you know, what are the issues? How can we um, bring you, you know, to our side of the table? And most times we do hear back from every member of the committee. Sometimes they don't respond. So those are the people who, you know, when you get to committee, you're counting votes beforehand to make sure you have enough to get it out. Sometimes you're short a vote or two, and it's because there are a couple of people who didn't bother to show their hand and tell you where they were. So that's where the testimony becomes very, very important because perhaps those legislators are saying, well, I want to wait to hear all of the testimony. I want to hear all of the support in the opposition before I make my decision. 
Um, so, you know, it, it, like I said, in this particular case, there was no backroom deals taking place. Um, we did a pretty good job beforehand of making sure we knew where everybody stood. Um, but that doesn't always guarantee success. You know, you can get a bill all the way through the Senate and the Assembly, and then the governor vetoes it. And he's done that before. And that's with Republican bills and Democrat bills. So it's never over until it's officially over. So you can't ever celebrate until that bill is signed. Right. And um, we we did have to make one concession, which was to put a sunset clause to it. And it was like, OK, if this is what you need, you know, we'll we'll do that. I wanted the sunset to be whenever f the fentanyl epidemic is over. But they made it to five years. Do you think that that was? I felt normal. like that was. A, that's normal. no. It's it's normal. They like to put sunsets on bills, and then of course, you know, that you come back with another bill at that five year mark, and someone does the bill to extend it. And honestly, sometimes I think that's just legislators' way of making sure they have bills to introduce down the road. <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> perpetual but that's what they do. It's, it's, yeah, perpetual job security, I guess. I don't know. But but it's it's very common to have the sunset in there. I didn't know that. I was, I was not happy about the sunset. Date. Yeah, it's common. I mean, it's it's frustrating because when you're in the process, and it's it, the bill's fine, you know, but somebody always wants to put their final little fingerprint on it and it's aggravating, but in this particular case, it you know didn't change what the bill does, so it's not worth arguing about. It's just you know you wish they could see it the same way you do, which is this is a happy to glad change, as we like to call it, and it's just not necessary. But don't argue, just you know don't speak past the yes, right? So get it through so, there, and get it signed. So we in five years we might have to go through this whole process again, or they can extend it they can extend it. And it would be another bill that someone introduces just to extend the sunset date. But that's how it would have to be done. Otherwise, it expires. Um, and usually extending the sunset dates aren't, I mean, I don't think I've ever seen a bill that was extending a sunset date that they didn't pass, honestly. Um, but somebody will in five years have to introduce a bill to do that. Well, it also gives us an opportunity in five years to evaluate the process because there's no I don't know if there's any teeth behind. I mean, starting January 1st, 2023, all hospitals in California will re are required um, now by law, by Tyler's law, to include fentanyl in drug tests. But if they don't do that, what's the consequences? So, yeah, well, well, they so, don't they don't like consequences. <laughs> right. So maybe if there are if this doesn't happen, then that's an opportunity in five years to put consequences. I hopefully it doesn't come to that. Right. I would hope not either, but, you know, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Right. So, Senator Melendez, you are a Republican in California. That must be fun. I'm on the endangered species <laughs> list, <laughs> along with some birds and waterfowl. Yeah, I'm on there with them. <laughs> so does does that, you know, you have this experience now, does that hinder um, you know, your legislative agenda? And how did that affect this bill? Um, you know, it can. It depends on the bill you're trying to get passed. I mean, obviously, if you're trying to get rid of a tax, uh, that bill is probably not going to go through. If you're trying to increase a tax, that definitely gets through. So um, for Republicans, it can be challenging for sure for us to get bills through. I mean, you know, on average, uh, a very small percentage of our bills actually ever make it out of committee. But, you know, this bill there was nothing controversial about it. And it certainly wasn't partisan. I think everybody has figured out that, um, you know, fentanyl does not discriminate based on political party. So that made it a little easier. Um, we didn't have, you know, that kind of partisan bickering like we did with Alexandra's law, which was because there was a, um, you know, an imposition of a greater uh, punishment for dealing fentanyl. And of course the two parties are not aligned on how they view how to solve that problem. One party says, well, no, we can't increase penalties. And our party says, well, we think that may be the way to help, you know, stem this tide. So uh, with this particular case, that just, you know, that wasn't the case. It wasn't a partisan issue. So, and I was so happy when a few Democrats jumped on to co-sponsor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they yeah, wanted to co-sponsor with you. Yeah, yeah, 13 co-authors. That's that's pretty good. That doesn't happen very often. <laughs> Not very often at all. Yeah, because it was a good, a good bill, a good idea, and actually, that um, 
that's heartening that that we have a political divide. But when there's something that's clear cut and bipartisan, that that doesn't stop the yeah. legislative process. So that's nice. And I don't know if you felt in your uh, career in California that, oh, well, she's got an R behind her name, so we're going to ignore that. Or are things issue driven or whether you're red or blue driven? Uh, it's issue driven. You know, I mean, usually it, I, I will say that, um, you know, I had a bill this year just to kind of give you the sort of backstory on the politics that that do take place sometimes there was a bill that i had it sailed through every committee there was no opposition it wasn't it wasn't controversial you know it was something to do with local level forms being turned in and so it was fine we had every expectation that the governor was going to sign it easy peasy well then um we had a bill where i had to kind of take uh take to task a member uh because of their bill and they didn't like that. And so when my non-controversial other bill got to the assembly, they killed it as retaliation <laughs> for Well, that's what I mean. That's so yeah. petty. That's not It is petty. It is, but it happens, you know. So, I mean, that's uh that's the game that we're in. So, I just I mean, I'm glad that they killed the other bill and not Tyler's law. So, you know, there's time for for, for the other bill to be reintroduced. And that's, it didn't have anything to do with saving lives like this one did. So, but it does, it does happen. You know, you have to, but you have to make a choice. You know, as a legislator, I, when I go up there, I'm as passionate about issues like Tyler's law as I am about other bills that I introduce. And I, I don't make any distinction between the two. I fight just as hard for all of them. Sometimes there's consequences, you know, to that, but that's, my job is to go up there and, and fight for the things I believe in for the constituents who bring me their bills. So it's all part of the process. You win some, you lose some. Yeah. And we thank you for, for that fight. Um, we then went to assembly and you told us that an assembly fight is harder than a Senate fight. Um, why, why is that? Is that because you're a Senator and you're not an assembly one or is it because assembly is just larger? Well, um, you know, I was in the assembly originally, so I know all those, or most of them over there. So that's kind of nice. You already have that camaraderie, um, but it's just, there's more of them. I mean, there's 80 assembly members. So you have more people who might um, have issues, concerns, have some sort of beef with your bill. So it's just, it's a bigger crowd to corral, um, but that would be the only reason. They don't necessarily think differently. It's just, you have more of them to consider. Right. And at this point, that's when the Hospital Association kind of came in with their objection. And um, Julie, maybe tell us a, what you heard about that and how did that affect you? Well, I thought it was kind of um, not, not say not good sportsmanship, but to come in at the last minute. Like if they had concerns, why didn't they bring them up? You, you know, the first the Senate hearing and why didn't they come to us with their concerns? Why did they? kind of sneak it in there. And Senator, how did that, how did that come about? How did you deal with that? Well, it is common, unfortunately, for people to come in last minute. I mean, I've had bills where they didn't even tell us ahead of time. They just showed up at the committee to, to testify in opposition. And we're saying, where have you been, you know, this whole time? So it happens. But I think, you know, during that particular hearing, Dr. Wood did a very good job of saying, look, your argument is just ridiculous. It doesn't hold any water here. And thank you for, you know, your input, but it's just not something we think is of a concern. So I think they were able to see through what the hospital association was trying to do. I'm really not sure why they even bothered because um, they didn't have a very strong argument. I understand that they had some concerns about cost, but they just didn't have a strong argument. So, but it does happen. I mean, it's not just me. It's not because I'm a Republican. It happens to everybody up there, Democrats and Republicans alike. And you just have to be prepared. You know, like we talked about in the beginning, you have to anticipate who's going to be against it. Why would they be against it? Sometimes you can think of all the reasons why somebody might oppose it. You just may not necessarily know who the players are going to be, but at least if you can kind of have a sense of that beforehand, you're, you're better equipped to kind of beat that sort of criticism back. 
And just in defense of the hospital association, because I sit on their committees, I work at a hospital, I like the hospital association. Um, I think their issue was an educational gap, really, um, that their their concern was, oh, well, our rural hospitals won't know how to do that. Um, yeah, they won't know how to do that. And they and then they're worried about the cost. And we showed them that the cost is 75 cents and kind of did the whole homework. And I, 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 I loved... Um, what Congressman Woods said, because he said we were worried about the costs, and and we they wanted to get an exemption for rural hospitals, and he clearly said, wait, aren't people dying in rural areas too? Um, yeah. A, and uh, and I think my favorite part of that hearing is offering free technical support to any hospital in all of California who has uh, issues, and I got one call um, from Lake Tahoe Hospital, and the lab lady called. She didn't know how to implement the testing and I told her and and then boom they have it done. And so I really think it's an educational gap uh rather um than ho- I think the hospitals really wanted to do that and we even had the script system uh, testify in favor of of mm-hmm. of the bill and they they implemented it. And then I think the cost is at the beginning when you tr- do something new there's always growing pains and then you forget about it you just do it. Right. And I I mean I I certainly understand where they were coming from because they are, you know, there's a lot of rules and regulations that the state government imposes on our hospitals and our physicians. And a lot of times those things cost money. And so I think we're at the point now where anything new, you know, people are just kind of panic mode thinking, my gosh, we can't handle one more mandate. But um, so I, you know, I'm sympathetic um, yeah, to how they right. initially felt, but I think they they got over that fairly quickly, and they didn't come out, you know, in fierce opposition to the bill. It was it was a tempered opposition, um, and and so obviously, you know, it was manageable, and you were able to um, kind of explain to them, it's not that hard, and I will happily help you. And I am so glad you got to help Lake Tahoe. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, and then we have a toolkit that's available to. You know, any hospital in America, we got it in California, but I would really ha- hope every hospital in America is knows, and it's, again, it's not it's not hard, um, but there is that educational uh, gap. And Senator, like you mentioned, you know, you can't celebrate. We got it through uh, Senate, we got it through Assembly, but don't be happy yet. There's one other stop. Was there ever a question that the governor may... Uh, Again, this was, I didn't know, this is a Republican bill, with, but you had a lot of co-sponsors. Was there a, ever uh, a fear that he would um, veto it? Well, you know, we had conversations with the governor's office about it because his office said, well, what, what about this concern that the hospital association raised? And so we were able to explain um, and certainly put to bed any fears they had. So we had a pretty good feeling that he was going to sign it. But again, you never know until the day comes. So you just kind of hold your breath and say, hope that nothing happens in between the time it's on his desk and the time he decides to pick up that pen. But we felt pretty good about it in the beginning because again, it was a nonpartisan issue, but um, it's it's just never a good idea to get a false sense of security uh, with any bill, even if it's one that's nonpartisan. And Julie, you know, the, it's kind of like that uh, the cartoon from School Hot Rock. He signed you, Bill. Now you're a law. And uh, Julie, I I was all excited. You were excited, and, and you expected some type of like ceremony. Yeah, I thought I I, I thought I'd get a pen. I knew you wanted a pen from the beginning. I, I mean, I back his office. I never heard back, and I just asked him if they would do a public signing. I know he doesn't usually but I don't think he had done any bills on fentanyl. So I thought it'd be a really good opportunity for him, but I never heard back from them. So so it was a little anticlimactic. Senator, is that is that normal? Um, so I don't know that the governor has ever done a signing ceremony with a Republican. Uh-huh. Um, there it's we just, go. Yeah. It, Not I, a good visual, I, huh? Don't, I've never seen it. But no, actually, I mean, I think it's a great visual. I think it's a great visual. For everybody. Absolutely. Bipartisan shows America together, mm-hmm. right? We want- and there, right, and there were thirteen co-authors on the bill, so it wasn't just you know Republicans. But um, mm-hmm. I have never seen it, even when I had uh, my whistleblower bill 
um, a few years ago that took me four tries to get through and they finally signed it. And that was a big deal. I mean, that was national news coverage about that bill as well. Good and Governor you. Brown, you know, we asked for a signing ceremony, something, and he was not interested, signed it, said nothing and moved on. So unfortunately, they don't make a big deal about it. But, you know, I will say we don't need them to make a big deal because the media is already covering it and it's helping you know, the word is getting out um, to, to parents and, and to people in this situation. And that's really what we want. Most important thing, obviously, is to get the hospitals to do this. So would it have been nice to for him to acknowledge all of your hard work and all of Julie's hard work? It sure would have. But uh, I don't think we need that to feel like, you know, we were successful. Right. So yeah, we we definitely have the celebration, and I do appreciate any of the the media stories that have come out about the the bill and getting that spread. And actually, uh, in next week, I have a meeting with the National Association of Attorney Generals, and I will definitely be speaking on that because I, I do think it's also, I mean, it's an easy win. You were able to do it as a Republican in California. Um, this should be something that's easy to do across our country. You would yeah, think. I agree. <laughs> yeah, I know. But common sense doesn't always prevail. Right. I think we've all figured that out. So <laughs> I, mean, I, I am trying to get it passed nationally, but Good. my my state senator, not state, my federal senator, my Feinstein, they Here. said they would keep an eye on it, which I wasn't quite sure what that meant. <laughs> so I am that, doing it yeah. to other people. That's kind of that sounds like a brush off to me. So you might want to be a little more persistent mm -hmm. about it. Um, and you can also just contact your member of Congress, you know, your House of Representatives um, representative to maybe introduce the bill. Congress does it differently. Um, it's it's not like, you know, the state legislatures where everybody can introduce their bills and move forward with them, whether they succeed or fail. Congress, I, it's a different kind of system. And I think their leadership has more say in who gets to introduce bills and who doesn't. Um, so it's a tougher push, but again, this is a bipartisan issue. So, right. I, and and the obstacle is the hospital association, and we understand, and I get it. No profession wants mandates on themselves. Mm -hmm. I I get that, and I I don't even, and most things I wouldn't want mandates. You would want things yeah. just to do it voluntarily because it's the right thing to do. But having the experience in San Diego and pushing our hospitals to do that, some of them, you know, within instantly added fentanyl, some of them needed that push. So unfortunately, um, I, I think the the mandate and the legislative process was the right thing to do for population health. Um, but uh, we'll see. Maybe we can have a good experience in California and have the California Hospital Association support it federally because go. if they have a good if they have a good experience you know yeah um, yeah that's a great idea yeah so uh all right so summary uh, julie having gone through and passed your first law what is what is your summary experience well, i don't have a summary experience. <laughs> <laughs> experience i don't know if i didn't pay attention in 10th grade civics class but i had no idea that it had to go through the senate and then the assembly after i didn't know the process so it was definitely a learning experience it was i mean i have to say it was a very positive experience and senator what about you for for a summary of for advocates who have ideas how do they present it in the best way um to give their local congressperson as an idea? Well, if someone has an idea for a bill in the state of California, your first step, of course, is to contact your legislator's office, whether that's your state assembly member or your state senator, your, you know, your choice. Um, but I will say that that does not mean that you will get a meeting directly with that assembly member or senator. Most times you're going to have a meeting with their staff first, because we get a lot of ideas from people that you know, some of them, um, they're a little nutty and some of them aren't even constitutional, you know, so you can't spend time listening to every idea. So usually you will meet with staff first. The staff will vet the idea and go, OK, this makes sense or this is definitely not even lawful or constitutional. And then they bring it forward to their boss 
um, to discuss, okay, what do you want to do with this? But if you have a good idea, absolutely send it to your representative. I get emails all the time from people who have, you know, ideas about legislation they think should be passed. And I respond to them and tell them either it's already been tried and they've already killed this bill. So just for historical, you know, background or, you know what, that's never been tried. Let's run with it. Or this just isn't legal to do, but that's your first step. And, you know, be persistent unless of course you're told this is not constitutional. <laughs> then there's nothing you can do about that, even though you might think it's a good idea, but you have to make the effort and, and hopefully you have a representative who, you know, takes on ideas from their constituents instead of just taking ideas from special interests. Sometimes that happens, um, but you got to be persistent and it's, um, it's not easy, but if it was easy, everyone would do it. Right. And Senator, you've had um, a wonderful legacy and your thank you for your service for California. Um, uh, we need you strong women who are willing to, to fight uh, for the right causes and your heart is in the right place. And we see that here as a, as a, as a mom working, I mean, all three of us are moms. Um, what is next for you? Your terming, your oh, term comes to yeah. an end. My term comes to an end this year. I, um, I took uh, over Senator Stone's term because he resigned from office. And so because of the term limit rules in California, I am only able to finish his term, which means that ends uh, this November. So, uh, you know, it's like early release for me from the legislature. <laughs> Two years early, I, I would have been serving until 2024 had I not switched to the Senate. Um, but uh, it's time for me to go back home and uh, be out of the legislative spotlight for now anyway. You know, I, I just, I don't like to see people stay in politics forever and a day and um, make that a career. I just, I don't think that's, that makes a healthy democracy. Um, so much as I have loved serving, golly, it's been such an honor and a blessing. Um, it is time for me to depart and let someone else take up the charge. I'm not going away, um, but I will be stepping away from public office, at least for the time being. That's great. And Julie, how about you? This has been a real success story for you and your foundation and and your family. And where where will this road be taking you? Well, right now I'm doing a lot of speaking at schools and to parent groups. And um, fortunately, uh, the news has been covering Tyler's Law and just other fentanyl deaths. And that is making people more aware. So I've gotten recently a lot of phone calls and requests to speak. I just do little things like I like just an idea will pop into my head and I'm like, wait, do airplanes have Narcan? Airplanes should all have Narcan. So then I start writing letters to them. I know Alaskan Airlines does, but American doesn't. So now I just make, you know, anything that pops into my head, I'm like, oh, let me research this and let me get on this. So wow. you're amazing. Thank you. I want to say thank you, Senator, for your service to our country, both in the military and in political capacity. Both those jobs are about service and sacrifice, and uh, really um, thank you for that, and our country is greater for that. And you too, Julie, for your amazing partnership and friendship, and may Tyler's memory continue to be a blessing to you and your family. Thank you. And thank you for your partnership. I could definitely couldn't have done it without you. Yeah, this is a pretty um, tough trio, I think, right here. So <laughs> God help them if we team up on something in the future. <laughs> That's right. Well, that would be an honor. Yeah, it would. Thank you for having us on, too. I appreciate the opportunity to kind of reconnect with you ladies and talk about the process. And hopefully it gives some other people some ideas and the, and the strength and courage to move forward with whatever idea has been kind of bubbling around in their head that they were a little unsure of, you know, how to how to move it forward. So thank you. Thank you for listening to High Truths on Drugs and Addiction, where national experts bring you facts and answer your questions. This week's episode would not be possible without the generous support from our sponsor. A sincere and warm thank you to FAF, Families Against Fentanyl. Visit familiesagainstfentanyl.org and sign the petition to declare illegal fentanyl a weapon of mass destruction. Make drug dealers think twice and three times before peddling killer drugs. Our producer is Dave Rivas from Davy Boy Productions. I am your host, Dr. Oni Lev. 
We hope we brought your day a little bit more high truths.